Welcome back to another episode of the Golf Industry Roundtable. I'm joined, of course, by my co-host Rob Hoffman, and we are excited to have everybody back, uh, sort of out of the woodwork. It looks like we're sort of coming out of the worst of this COVID thing. Golf's back on TV. Players are back on the courses, and uh, people are still listening to the podcast. This is number five, so yeah. uh, we, we had a goal. We made it to six, so it was a home run, so we're doing great, Rob. I want to sort of kick it over to you to introduce sure. um, today's guest, because I'm really excited about this. It's sort of the evolving frontier of marketing and golf, and, and the two dynamic guests we have today are going to sort of point the way, so... I'm uh, I'm excited to stop talking about the coronavirus and start talking about something productive. I'm sure we'll mention it a little bit and how it's kind of playing out for you guys. But I wanted to take time to uh, introduce everybody, well, our guests this week. We have Tisha Allen, a professional golfer, golf media personality. I'll let her describe it a little better for you. And Jess McAllister from Digital Golf Collective. So, Tisha, why don't you go ahead and start and then Jess take over from there. Tell us a little bit about you are your role in the industry your background coming into it and w what you do now for the, the golf world because they're listening right now <laughs> yeah absolutely so just like you said it I'm former professional golfer now golf media personality I've been in golf my entire life been playing since three competing since seven I played on the junior level competitive level high school level collegiate level then to professional level I play professionally from 2015 to 2018 and I still carry the title of professional in case I ever do want to go back. But because of golf, I have been able to create a platform through social media, which has led to what I do now, which is essentially being a golf influencer, golf media personality. I like to say a lot better because I feel like it encompasses a lot more uh, things to do than just living on social because a lot of what I do is on social, but it's also in person and events and hitting shots and literally entertaining to every possible degree that you could literally think of like <laughs> you name it I'll do it um and so that's that's kind of what I do now in a, in a very broad very broad picture cool Jess nailed it yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I'm Jess. I own digital marketing agency with my partner, Sean. Um, we started this a couple years ago. Uh, we went public with it, let's say the end of last year, uh, kind of gearing up for the new season. And we are a full service digital marketing agency and talent brand management agency. So we have a 50-50 split business model where we manage talent, amazing talent, like Tisha, um, and a few others that everyone knows of, um, from trick shot artists to media personalities to pro athletes, you name it, both men and women, um, super diverse. And then on the other side, on our brand side, we advise and create digital strategies, social strategies for brands in the space, brands looking to reach the golf industry and golf audience. Um, most of the tournament organizations and their corporate sponsors and kind of echoing what Tish said, you know, a lot of what we do um, is experiential branding, right? And so it's on the ground, but it's also on social. Um, obviously right now with the turn of events this year, sorry to bring up COVID. Um, <laughs> it, it's really pushed us as an agency, but also our clients to get more creative in how we can support our partners. Um, you know, although the schedules have changed, um, the audience is still there. People want golf. People need that touch point. They need that emotional pull, whether it's through the players, whether it's through the tournament organizations, whether it's through the corporate sponsors are used to seeing. And the way to create that visibility is through influencers um, and talent like Tish, who everybody follows. Everybody's kind of waiting to see what she's doing next um, and see what story she has to tell. So that's kind of what we do. Um, and what's great about having the business model that we have is we're able to leverage that crossover um, between our talent and bring them opportunities with our brand clients our brand clients, we have an arsenal and collective network of influencers and talent that reach far beyond our exclusive talent. We also have a collective of about 100 other celebrities, athletes, influencers, you name it, um, to really help kind of execute these campaigns and uh, create that reach. Cool. Well, let, can we talk about that a little bit? I want to talk a little bit about the uh, the, the influencer economy, if you will. Um, 
I know that I think so the the range of the business that I'm in is more just golf courses from all types of golf courses from resorts coach Rusty's a member at one that we do a lot of the marketing for the Ritz Carlton in Orlando um, mm-hmm. a, a little bit of all of that that, that we cover is really just on the golf course operator side they're listening right now. Kyle, though, with the golf wires, all different verticals within the industry, from apparel to equipment manufacturers to the agronomy side of things. And one thing that I've noticed a little bit, because one of the first conversations I had with you, Tisha, a few years ago was um, with Women With Drive and talking about, you know, getting pros out to the courses for events at courses, whether it was a beat the pro on a par three during a scramble or whatever it might have been that you were doing. But you guys have really crossed over into uh, making an impact within every vertical in the industry from Cobra Puma, AT&T, uh, events like the U.S. Open or, or different things like that going on. So maybe you guys can talk a little bit to that economy and what's, you know, the impact that you're having within these verticals. So some of our listeners that have not pushed their way into an influencer economy can can understand how it could benefit them. Yeah, I mean, I can go ahead and give an overarching outline of that and Tish let you kind of touch on um, your day-to-day around that, which is a lot, Uh, you know, and I want to say a few years ago, it was kind of a, it still is the wild west. It's going to be for a long time. I feel like, especially in the golf industry, Um, but it is, you know, you started to see this influx and transition and different variation of branding and advertising and endorsements, right, outside of the traditional athlete or tour player. Um, you know, you have all these girls on the rise on the Symmetra tour and all of that that are just like so good at marketing themselves on social media, right? Um, that's kind of how Tish got into this being an athlete and, you know, at the height of social media and Instagram and all of that, being able to market yourself, right? And um, show your value as an athlete, as a person and everything else you are and have to offer to the world, right? Um, And from a branding standpoint, it's so, there's so much opportunity that I feel like is still untapped and, you know, going to what you're saying about everything from apparel to accessories, to clubs, to courses, to events. Um, something we've been able to do really well and something that our talent does really well, um, you know, is representing these brands kind of full circle. Um, you know, all, most of them have, you know, full apparel and shoe sponsors. They have equipment sponsors. They have phone sponsors, <laughs> like, you know, it's like, you name it and protein sponsors, whatever it is. Uh, but it's something that they're truly passionate about. And we only partner with brands that, you know, have that foresight of wanting to work with people like us and really tap into our talents audiences, which are mainly kind of the youth, I would say youthful um, to the 20, 30, 40 market. Um, but, you know, using Tisha as, a, as an example, having a long standing relationship with both Cobra and Puma. So she's kind of all set from apparel and equipment to really developing these, um, I guess, alternative programming opportunities and branding opportunities, like with AT&T, we're now in what, year two or three, two Mm -hmm. with them. Um, Mm -hmm. And she's a part of the athlete team, you know, with Jordan Spieth and the others. And it's just, it's really cool to see that and cultivate that relationship because when they're doing their tournaments, for example, which they have two each year, their players are playing, you know, Maria Fossey is obviously not playing on these PGA Tour events, but, uh, you know, he's playing. So why not have someone on the ground that can capture what AT&T is actually doing from the fan side, from the consumer side, right? And those are the same people that are following Tisha, you know, and they run up to her and want to take a photo and they're wearing their Puma (laughs) outfit and, you know, all of that. So there's, there's such value in branding someone like Tish um, and not from a, not from an exploitation standpoint, but more so finding brands that align with each person, each personality, each athlete, trick shot artist, whoever it may be, um, because it just drives that passion a little bit more uh, when it comes to these creative activations. And you'd be people would be surprised, like the amount of creative input that our talent have with the brands. It's very collaborative. It's not transactional. Um, although I think that's what scares people kind of in that influencer economy is <laughs> what's the ROI or, 
I paid this much. How come I'm not making money? Or what are we going to get from it? Or, you know, why would I pay you? And it's like, oh my God. So every day is like education, handholding. Um, and what's great is we have talent with longstanding relationships with large partners in the golf space that are trusting like MasterCard, like AT&T, like USGA, Cobra Puma. And, you know, one example of that is it took us almost two to three years to get a partnership with farmers insurance. You know, like they've never done influencer marketing before. They're very weary about it. They're very conservative. Um, and a lot of these kind of financial insurance institutions, uh, it's a big risk for them, right? Especially if they don't understand it. And so they saw what we did last year with a few different activations with their agency of record, who's one of our partners. Um, and they, they gave us the green light this year. We got to create a really fun activation around um, farmers insurance in the open and Tisha was there and they were over the moon, you know, and like, I don't know what's going to happen next year with everything going on, but, <laughs> but fingers crossed we're back at tournaments, right? By the top of the year. Uh, but that, that, that's kind of how I see it. There's been a big growth moment and transition over the last three years from no influencer marketing in golf to this like full-fledged boom, you know, mm -hmm. um, and you kind of have the OGs like this one over here who from the beginning has just set a really good example. Yeah. So. OG at what, 25? Uh, um, <laughs> hey, so, I know. She's a great content creator. I'll give her that. She Here's sure is. Yeah. This, um, Gail, this it's funny, too, when you talk about youth and people watching, um, even my daughter. So anybody that my daughter's ever met that I've done any work with her business, they're my friends. And um, a ship sticks commercial will come on the golf channel here at home and and Haley she's eight she's playing golf now she's hit a couple drives she's getting the ball out to about 70 yards now off the tee which I'm thrilled Ew. about as her dad but she'll awesome. see Tisha and Nikki or whoever on tv and she's like daddy they're your friends that we because I don't know if you remember but she met you at Aviara a couple of years ago so yeah she gets excited about it which I think is great to, to exercise that influence in the game too, because any brands, obviously, I mean, it's just marketing one-on-one, any brands that they're following, that influence carries over to uh, purchase decisions for these kids as they're coming up too. So, and, and right. some brand and loyalty for sure. They're running to their parents and saying, you know, look, right. I need this new Puma shirt or hat or right. you know, Buy this. whatever yeah. it may be, because they want right. to be just like them. And we, we do a lot of um, really fun kind of clinic stuff on the ground at tournaments too, where she, you know, her and some other clients of ours get to interact with a lot of the kids that come on site. And you'd be surprised, you know, the amount of kids that recognize these guys and girls we work with and just get so excited. Yeah. <laughs> So adults too, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I think just going off that point, like to everything Jess said, she basically said it all perfectly from a business standpoint, but I think, and I, and I say this so much to through other podcasts or other interviews that being an influencer or being known through your social media, it's very different in a sense where people follow you. Like for instance, for myself, people follow me because they truly believe that I am their friend. You know, they feel like they relate to me. They feel like they know me. When I get so many messages probably every week about the Ship 6 commercial saying like, oh my gosh, I totally know that girl. Like, I know this girl. Oh my God, it's because I follow her. You know, it's just, it's so different because between like an athlete or celebrity, there is a, there is a gap between actually reaching them, right? And, and with influencers, we are extremely relatable. I feel like real influencers, really good influencers do that very well and they know how to relate to their audience. And so we kind of bridge that gap between that extreme celebrity, like A-lister, I suppose, and, and fans to, to just engage. And like when we're branded, I think that, that that's important because not everyone's gonna be, for instance, in golf, a professional golfer but it's very possible for people to be more like me, like just want to be a, just want to be good at golf. They just want to be able to go hang out at tournaments. They want to be able to rock these brands. And I, I'm kind of like the proof for them to show like, yes, you don't need to be that tour player to do this. You can just be extremely relatable and build a following and build an audience and be relatable just through that. And so, like I said, yeah. Yeah. Another personality. <laughs> so that kind of brings a point, and I imagine it. I don't know if it's a 
fine line you have to toe at all in this or if you just slam right across the line and, and, and forget about it. But I, I think one of the reasons that you're as relatable as, as you are and a lot of other social influencers as well in this regard is how much of your um, personal life you you share in this, that people are able to get to know you. And I think that that's part of what helps you kind of build on this brand and, and build the level of influence you have. But is it difficult? I mean, in, in building this, you know, how, how, how much do you, you know, let people in or, or not mm -hmm. as you're doing this and where does it play in with, uh, with, with brand marketing too? Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I think, I think one of the things that many influencers do is they give a deeper insight into their life, which is why they become so relatable because you see these different aspects. And I think for me personally, I, my personality alone is very open. I really don't have much to hide. I'm not a person that's good at hiding things to begin with. And so when I show, let's say my siblings and my family, or I show, you know, my loved ones or whatever else, I think that that's another aspect of my life that becomes more relatable beyond golf. And that's what I want to be. And I think that's what, and I feel like that's why I'm also able to bring in people who aren't necessarily golfers and they want to try golf because I bring in a different relatable aspect. And yes, it, it does like to be very honest. Yeah, it can be a lot. I don't think that this kind of life is for everyone. For someone who wants to be very private, this is probably, you know, not it, not it for you. But I think I, Go ahead, Sorry, I was going to say like you do such a good job. Well, the whole point of all this is like you humanize yourself, right? right. So like you're humanizing the brands that you work with. So someone might not have known all the things AT&T are doing if they weren't following you, like you're that bridge, right? And so, and right. another thing to touch on the personal stuff, I think anyone in the spotlight, it's hard. And um, being Pride Month, Tisha had a really big moment a year ago, and we were able to celebrate that moment of her coming out um, in partnership with Scratch TV, which is a creative entity of the PGA Tour, and help celebrate this moment during Pride last year, right? Um, and even going to Pride in LA, and like, I think we filmed it, where did we film it? At at t Byron Nelson, actually, didn't we? In yeah. Dallas? Which is, yeah. Uh -huh. Um, you know, and talk about getting personal. It's like the oh, yeah. thought process of getting to that point of, okay, are you ready to do oh. this? Are you sure you want to do this? Okay. And we were on the plane to the Bahamas for the <laughs> showdown when it went live. So we couldn't even see when you it was couldn't live. respond to anything when it was going on. Cause oh, I remember here. I shot you a text right after it. I'm like, Hey, this is really great. You know, I'm proud of yes. you for, for sharing yeah. this at the moment, but, um, which I'm sure you got a million of the same kind of text. And I think it's been yeah. really well, well received. It's overall. so positive. Yeah. It, yeah, it has been scary, but well, well worth it. I mean, looking back at it now a year, it's like everything that I questioned myself before thinking like, can I ever, is this even possible? Can I even do this? Is this even something I need to do? And now uh, being a year past that, it's like, wow, I can't even imagine my life if I never did that. I can't imagine... Yeah, the weight lifted off my shoulders. And again, you know, giving this, this much personal, you know, detail about my life, it's not for everyone, but I very much am willing and I want to take on that role of, of being responsible for other people who feel like they're in this situation, whatever it is. It could just be a female golfer. It could be a golfer that wants to come out. It could be an athlete that wants to come out. It could be just someone who wants to get into a, a female that wants to get into the golf world, whichever, whatever it is. I, I am willing to be that person to take all the hits moving forward and create that change and, and start first. I think, you know, being a leader in that space and to your point is like being that pillar of fighting fear, right? Whether, mm -hmm. whether it's a young kid, because again, she has a lot of young people following her that maybe were in the same boat and she's unlocked this whole other community right? That don't feel afraid anymore because she's sharing her story. And it's also unlocked a lot of amazing opportunities within golf, which is super yeah. cool. Um, yeah. But like, I think as a personality in such a interesting sport and industry, that's not like any other to be able to have that powerful voice, be a leader and showing an example, positive example of what can be done, how it can be done and her why I think is just ultimately so powerful. So 
While the Orlando corner is quiet. We, I've just been <laughs> taking it all in. Uh, you know, this deep deep from conversation. The golf, yeah. <laughs> from the golf wire, this is kind of a, 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 a growing subject area of interest for many of our clients and how to leverage social and way to, ways to actively get involved. So I've got a question maybe for both of you, and it's basically how to get started. So maybe I'll start with Tisha and then come to Jessica. But Tisha, how would somebody who wants to be a social media influencer get started? I mean, if coming out of college, you, you know, I don't know if you have to have a bunch of street cred or if you can just work your way up <laughs> to some threshold of a, of a million followers to where you can call yourself an influencer. Um, but I'm just, I'm just curious how, what would you say to somebody young out, not, not, not even necessarily young because mm -hmm. social influencing covers all gamuts, right? But somebody who just wants to make a transition into this space. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I get this question quite often, especially from literally that demographic of, you know, young females or just young, young people coming out of college. And I wish I could give you one formula to get there. But in, in actuality, like I came at the right time and I made use of the opportunity that was presented to me. Does that mean that everyone, that not everyone can get into it? No, everyone can get into it. It does take a lot of dedication and work, just like anything else you do. And it takes a lot of time before you see any return. So I think right now, let's say if someone to ask me right now if they wanted to get into social media, I would tell them to really look at the numbers and really evaluate which platform they think that they can relate to best and then go from there. So I've been advising a lot of young people to hop on what's called TikTok. It's another social platform. It's really for the 25 age and under. And I'm now exceeding that threshold, trying to live on it. It's quite <laughs> difficult. Let me tell you It's it's something different. But the thing is, is that you want to hop in the right wave of whichever social media platform is happening, and go from there. Because if you go on the happening platform, then you'll have the most potential to grow, and you can use that platform as leverage to the rest. And now within that, now you got to figure out what's your niche, what's going to make you different, what is it that you're super passionate about. And it has to be something that you are extremely passionate about because if you are not, you will burn out and you will just, you know, create videos maybe for a month and then you're like, ah, there's no return. Yeah, of course, guess what? I didn't see my first deal until a year and a half into it. And that was something that I was just doing for fun. It was, I want my golf swing. I want my professional golf career to be seen. So I just kept putting myself out there. And then I got my first just gig. Just, hey, do you want to do this for X amount? We'd love for you to show up. And I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah, that would be amazing. I am so forever grateful. Like I came at it at a very passionate, like for fun kind of level. And for people who want to go into this as like a career, it's very, very important that you love what you do because you have to go, go at this for quite a while. Like I said, before you're going to see a return. And put in the work. Put in the work. And not just, it's not just about pretty pictures. I'm sorry. Like it's, you're going to have to do a lot more than that. Yeah. But being unique is a big part of it. And do you feel like you have to be everywhere on all of the different platforms? Or do you focus on, on one or two and then just put a sprinkle on the others? Because like you said, I mean, there's, there seems to be a new platform you know, every month or certainly every year. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I mean, I think there's always going to be one spearheading platform that you're going to live on and perform the best on. And you want to use that as leverage for everywhere else. But essentially, you do want to sprinkle sprinkle around everywhere because you just don't know what's going to hit next and you don't want to start from scratch there so for example between twitter facebook tiktok youtube and instagram <laughs> i make sure that i, I know <laughs> I <laughs> think <laughs> this, is, think this is not a job this is a job full time yeah. okay well and yeah and like <laughs> you need to be able to survive because not one platform is going to carry you forever like being exactly. platform agnostic is so important because yeah if one goes down one day, like we've experienced it when certain yeah. platforms freeze <laughs> or are, have a cyber attack or something, like where are you going to live? You know, you need to make sure that you are, but you're, that you, all platforms are different though, right? They're not all equal. So the type of content that you're putting on TikTok is not what you're putting on Instagram. It could be a variation of it, but it's not yeah. the same. Um, same with YouTube and all of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Tisha is literally on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and she's blown up on TikTok in a matter of months and has mm -hmm. more following on TikTok now than on Instagram <laughs> that you can yeah. imagine. <laughs> oh, wow. It's been, yeah. Yeah, I, I've noticed that actually a little bit with um, 
I mentioned the eight-year-old in monitoring what she looks at, obviously. <laughs> but the uh, the numbers of followers on TikTok are outrageous mm-hmm. compared to Instagram. Yeah. I mean, it's mm-hmm. 10x uh, a lot of times from from some yeah. things I've seen. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah. so Jess, let me ch- uh, switch the how-to over to you. We work with a lot of uh, brands. Uh, and new companies at the PGA show. They have a whole new product expo. Right. And so we, we work with them and getting some press releases and, and some information out each year about their new product. And they're always, new, I'm noticing more and more, they're like, what can you tell us about social media influencing? Do you know anybody? How can we get into it? What would you say to a, not the Cobra Pumas of the world, but a young brand, maybe with a negative marketing budget yeah. that um, wants to try and leverage this space with limited resources? Is that possible what would you say to them yes it is possible um but you know there's a lot that goes into it right and again i, I want to circle back to things not being transactional although at the end of the day is it a business transaction yes do people need to be compensated for their time and audience yes because essentially the brand is using this person to tap into a consumer audience right to make sales so why wouldn't they be compensated in some form right sometimes it's trade product sometimes it's like lifetime membership but i don't know (laughs) anything right um so it really depends on the the product and the brand but i would say you as a brand owner or marketer need to make friends, like reach out to these influencers, introduce yourself, engage with their platforms and talk to them. They're again, they're real people, right? They're not going to be like, pay me. I mean, sometimes, but so I feel like a lot of times these brands launch, they have their website, they invest in the PGA show, right? Or Mm -hmm. sponsoring a party during PGA show or whatever it may be but then lack that um, humanizing touch point and communication. And so I feel like, you know, if there's a certain influencer you're trying to get in front of, you know, there's people like me who manage a lot of these talent and I'm always open to sharing information. I mean, a lot of times I ask if the talent's interested first and if they're interested, like, here you go, here's an introduction, get creative, right? How can we collaborate? short term or long term what are you looking to do right and a lot of times what brands don't understand when they go to market is they don't know what they're looking for right because there's a difference between brand awareness and sales so when you're just launching and people want sales immediately i tell them no (laughs) that's the wrong wrong direction to go down and i think you know an awareness campaign will get you a lot further and um, the sales will come. They will generate once you get in front of people, right? And it's psychology, it's brand recognition. You get in in front of someone enough times, now you build trust. How do you do that? You leverage people like Tisha, who people trust, right? In some sort of agreement, whether that's a couple story posts or it's her talking about her experience with the product, um, or maybe it's like a monthly giveaway or something like that, where she's now directly tangibly engaging her audience in some way. So, you know, I think it's definitely possible. And, you know, I've seen it plenty of times where um, we we get approached by brands all day, every day in the golf space, not in the golf space and small, large, you name it. And people are fearful, right? They're fearful of spending the money. Right. And again, it, it is an investment just as you would invest in a full page ad at the end of a magazine that someone's probably not gonna see or pay attention to, why wouldn't you use that ad spend and spread it out across a couple social media influencers and you're getting more unique you know, reach and visits and clicks than you would through something else. To your point with creativity too, one thing that we have noticed is um, through some of the marketing we've done, we do a lot for Marriott Golf Academy and Marriott Golf and thus some Marriott International Resorts through this. And we have worked uh, in particular LPGA Q School time um, since it's hosted here in the desert at 
yeah. one of the Marriott properties at Shadow Ridge, uh, which is also host of Marriott Golf Academy. We've worked with Haley Ostrom and Savannah Vallabi and some of them coming in where it's, we've sponsored their stay um, right. for just some of the brand awareness or a little bit of coaching um, through Marriott Golf Academy. So some of those things too, when you're talking about getting creative, it doesn't always have to be a big outlay of cash sometimes. If you're right. with a brand ambassador that could make just as good a use of your product through, you know, if you are a hospitality company through lodging right. at Symmetra tour stops or different things like that could be, could be of, of super importance in building well, like, your career also. So. Yeah. So. And you mentioned, you know, you work with uh, the Ritz Carlton property in Orlando where mm -hmm. one of our other clients, Coach Rusty is a member, but mm -hmm. they're not paying him, you know, but right. does he have a free membership to the Ritz Carlton? <laughs> <laughs> and he plays right. there every day. It's it a does. place for him to record all of his content. So he needs a place to record content and the property needs promotion and coverage. So now you have this organic play and he's there mm -hmm. quite literally every day if he's in town. He's yeah. bringing his son there. He's bringing his buddies there. And, um, you know, I think his fishing rod lately too. I saw yeah, all, all yeah. so. a lot. Um, and, <laughs> and with this, though, we have a similar setup um, with Aviara in San Diego. Unfortunately, they're closed right now due to the current climate, but um, same kind of setup where it's like, okay, we're going to comp you X amount of dinners and whatever at the fancy restaurant, a spa day, all these things, plus endless amounts of golf, right? As long as you talk about it, post about it, tag it, right? Because imagine for a normal person, how much that actually costs, right? Mm -hmm. But now from a visibility standpoint, they're getting that exposure to her audience, right? Now people are like, hmm, I wanna go to Aviara or I'd like to buy, <laughs> you know, and now she can give them a discount code or whatever it may be. So mm -hmm. it's almost, I mean, I'm, I'm a PR background. So for me, it's like a form of PR form of advertising, PR, social media, all kind of mixed into one because it's at the end of the day, it's still storytelling. You know what I mean? Um, what, and it depends on who you're telling it through, right? And it depends on the message you're trying to drive home for a brand or a product or a company. Um, and I think that, you know, going back to your question, yes, it's certainly possible, but I also challenge a lot of these brands to really think about what they're, what they're willing to invest you know, from product, monetary, um, creative output, right? And working with us and coming up with that collaboration. And we're really big on making sure it's a collaboration and a partnership and not a one-way street, um, you know? And some people aren't satisfied with Instagram or influencer marketing, like we've experienced that. I don't understand it when we see the sales going up and we see the brand visibility, but, some people just aren't comfortable with it and will pull back and that's okay. And maybe they'll come back later. Maybe they won't, but you know, they got a really good experience and we were able to get the brand in front of a specific audience, but, but yeah, it, I, it's definitely possible. And, you know, I'm more than willing to talk to anybody and help answer questions. Like I said, I feel like a broken record sometimes educating people on a daily basis. But again, it is still fairly new and it's also very much new in the golf space. Yeah. So. And, and with it being new, I think we were offline or at the top of the hour, you, you said it's sort of like the wild west sometimes. Mm -hmm. Has there been any coalescing around best practices about saying paid for Paid for posting or Absolutely. disclosing Absolutely. affiliate links or I mean, how, how is that coming together? God forbid regulation, but there, there must be some. Well, by law, the FTC. Yeah. yeah. So FTC law is you must disclose monetary um, transactions online. So a lot of times, you know, you'll either see sponsor, hashtag sponsored, hashtag ad, hashtag partner. Uh, usually it's like the brand partner. Um, typically, if you're kind of more in depth with the partnership, you, you have a closer relationship there, you know, you're getting white labeled through the brand and you're working through their socials. Um, and you'll see that kind of in paid partnership tool at the top of Instagram and some other platforms as well. And, um, legally it does have to be disclosed. So people that are not can get in trouble. I don't think that, I think it'll be a minute before the FTC puts a hammer down on the golf industry. Cause we're still a little behind. 
Uh, but you know, celebrities and influencers and athletes get in trouble every day for not disclosing that. And it is a big no, no. And it is a big fine. And I am very strict about that. You can ask Tisha. I mean, it, uh, it, it, seem, it so. seems to me like, I mean, we were talking about somebody coming up new, like I want to be a social media influencer. I want to, you know, I want to be the next Tisha Allen. Mm -hmm. Um, Without somebody like you, and I'm not saying you couldn't do it, Tisha, but without somebody like you helping manage some of this, Jess, I can imagine it would get pretty messy for somebody trying to break into this, the potential for problems they would create. Well, oh, absolutely. I, yeah. 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 This, this is the voice messy. of experience. <laughs> I, I also feel like, you know, the younger, the younger kids, uh, <laughs> they kind of understand how this all works, right? Because they're not following a traditional music artist or app. They're following influencers. They're following YouTubers. Right. They're following TikTokers. So they mm -hmm. understand what's going on. Um, but for those that are trying to get into it, typically with a responsible brand or company, larger company, corporate, whatever it is, they know what has to be done. Yeah. And usually they'll produce guidelines and what, you know, do's and yeah. don'ts, um, what to include. Um, how to speak to the brand, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, there's usually a contractual agreement, what you're signing off on, mm -hmm. but, you know, there's been times where brands, you know, will do stuff on trade, you still have to disclose it as, like, right. a gift or speaking to it saying, they let me or they gave me or whatever, making sure that that's still stated, because um, it's still technically a transaction. Um, you know, and then if it's paid, yeah, you got to disclose that. But when you're newer, they'll tell you, you know, they'll let you know, like, can you please mm -hmm. put ad or sponsored? And the problem with putting those things on your post these days is unfortunately, you know, Instagram isn't making money from these ads, hashtag ads or sponsored. So the algorithm kind of gets in the way. And I think that detours a lot of people from adding that or, oh, mm -hmm. I don't think anyone will find mm -hmm. out or things like that but it's it's really imperative that you follow the rules I'll just tell you that I've been doing this for years <laughs> yeah. um and you know I I also am against people having management until they really need it because mm -hmm. if you can't tell me who you are and where you want to go then how am I supposed to help you gotcha. you know what I mean yeah. so yep. I help you get to your end point I help you create new opportunities I help guide you along the way I can create you but I fear that that won't end well because you should be able, you should want to do something for yourself. You should know who you are. You should have goals ultimately, you know, and we get approached by a ton of micro influencers in the golf space and not in the golf space for representation. And so we kind of add them to our collective to field opportunities for them. Um, but you know, unless your, your inbox is blowing up or your DMS are blowing up and you can't manage that and you don't know how to negotiate, that's when I, that's when I think it's time to bring someone in. But until you get to that point, it, it, it you should be able to manage those things on your own. And if you yeah, need help I agree. negotiating, you know what I mean? Like Tisha has some smaller influencers that come to her and ask her for help. And it's a nice yeah. down effect. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I mean, like before, before Jess, I was under a different management, but that was more for being an athlete. Like there wasn't much, many deals outside of, you know, playing professionally. But I think like as to the point that Jess is saying that a lot of it is to the responsibility of the influencer themselves. And, and, you know, for a while there were people and other managements approaching me even while I was under a management and I didn't even feel like I was deserving of it because I didn't feel like I had enough you know, DMs and emails and all this coming in. Like I didn't even feel like I was worthy enough. And so I feel like this is so important for any influencer who wants to be an influencer. It's never about, hey, how did you get Cobra Puma? How did you get AT&T? It's not that. It's not how did I get there? It's I, how do you show value to those brands? What am I bringing to these brands that they don't already have? Mm -hmm. So don't tell me, like, how did you get Cobra Puma? It's like, no, I had to try and prove myself to these brands. That's why I believe I'm different. You may have a hundred thousand more followers than me but what is different about you what is it that that i have that you don't have or vice versa and so that question i will constantly ask people and usually that same question back is what deters them because it's not right. about what, how you get it it's how how are you able to prove your worth to them put in the work and i always <laughs> encourage these smaller influencers that are trying to grow or trying to get brand deals 
Um, maybe they saw a couple brands launch at PGA show and they're like, man, I, I DM them. They haven't gotten back to me. Post about them, buy something from the brand, mm -hmm. show that you truly are a fan of the product or company yeah. or property, whatever it may be, and talk about it, tag them, you know, mention them, share what they're up to. Cause they're going to see that. Right. And then they're going to yeah. be like, wow, that's a really good representation. Like maybe we can do more together. And so I always encourage, you know, even all of our team, you know, if there's a brand that you like, I'll get you product <laughs> if you want, yeah. but go out there, talk about it, tag them. Not everything is going to be a monetary exchange. You know, you got to, mm -hmm. and it comes down to authenticity, right? Like you have to authentically, mm -hmm. truly want to engage with the brand or the product. And that also comes from the brand side too. Like you have to want to authentically partner with someone like mm -hmm. Tisha because you believe that she's a true representation mm -hmm. of the message that you're trying to get out there or a product or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. so. Can we shift gears and briefly talk about golf for a moment? Um, yeah. It's been a big <laughs> initiative. It's been a big initiative across uh, the golf industry for a lot of years. We've all heard, you know, the growth of the game, how, you know, if you're a PGA professional, how are you growing the game? If you're involved from a management level in the industry, how are you growing the game? And I think one of the fa fastest or quickest growing segments of the game has been uh, women. In, in the game over the years, um, over the last decade, especially. What role has social influencing? What, you know, what are you guys doing in particular, if you have any specifics uh, with growth of the game in, in mind, or what have you seen just as a result of, of some of the things you're doing to help grow the game? And then maybe that also translates to some of these brands we're talking about as well, because it's growth into their verticals within the industry as well. Mm -hmm. I'll let Tisha yeah. speak to that and I'll go after you. Yeah. I mean, the, the answer to me is not a long one at all. I think the most important thing is that us influencers is that we're making the game look fun. We're showing the side of golf that isn't seen on TV because what's seen on TV is basically professional golf, which professional golf is amazing. But again, not everyone is going to make it to that level. And I think it's already been known for quite some time that it's always been a gentleman's game. And it's a very common sport for the boys to go out and go vacation and do their thing and whatnot. And for women who maybe want to get into it and maybe question getting into it, did not there wasn't really an example to that. There wasn't really, oh, hey, let's go on a girl's golf trip. Like that wasn't a thing. And I think social media has really helped bridge that gap to show that there is a young female golf audience that loves to go golf, that love to do it for fun, that maybe need other friends and want to meet other people and become more inviting. And I think that, you know, this whole social media female golf space has really become a community. And it's so easy. Like I may not have met every single influencer that's a female golfer I've met most but even if I were to just follow one and then I were to see them for the first time in person we would pick up as if I knew everything and that was like that was the beauty of social media because I was like oh my gosh you're another female golfer you're from Hawaii I'm going to Hawaii can we go play like that's so cool because we never there wasn't that before for female right. golfers you know and so like I said we're basically bridging that gap and showing you know, golfers who want to be casual golfers, especially that you can absolutely go and have fun with other girls and that there are girls that already do that. Right. And I feel like social media, as daunting as it is, um, has really created this safe space of community, right? Um, to showcase that it is okay to go to the driving range by yourself. It's okay to ask for help. And you know, something that these girls have done so well. And that's, you know, how I got started in the golf space was strictly through how to empower more women in golf. You know, four years ago, the percentage of female golfers was so low. By the end of last year, according to the National um, Golf Foundation is, you know, women are leading by a very large percentage in the, the fastest growing segment in the game, right? Um, and with that, you know, when the girls started, um, women would drive and all that years ago they really created this online community of women across the country even across the world um this like safe haven to answer questions to provide help and how to's and meetups across different cities um so these girls did feel okay you know going to the golf course or asking their dad to take them to whatever or join the team their high school team or whatever it may be um you know and since then you know, these girls are still still leaders in this space. These girls ask questions every day. They've really created this 
forum platform community that I think has driven a lot of this female growth in the game, you know, from the influencer side and then from the player side, I want to say, yeah, I want to say the last like three years, you saw this new wave of young people on tour, right? Both on LPGA and PGA tour of like yeah, young, young athletic guys and girls that are all friends and hanging out. And it's like, oh, wow. Like I want that. Right. And living this fun life and hanging out in Orlando together or whatever. And so mm -hmm. it's, I think that seeing that and then seeing what Tisha and these girls are doing and you know, these girls take time out of their day to answer questions and take calls and do Skypes and all this with these young girls. And we do clinics, like I said, at various tournaments. And um, we've partnered with a lot of brands that want to give back to the community. Um, you know, so it's, there's definitely a fast, steady growth happening with women in the space. And I don't think it's stopping anytime soon. Um, to something Tisha said is, you know, the, yeah, it's a male dominated sport has been still is. Uh, but you know, guys would go on go weekend golf trips. And now you have groups of girls going to Mexico and like, you know, going on fun trips. You see, like they've done plenty of those group trips. Um, we had a, a bunch planned for this year, but here we are. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and these brands want to get on board, right? Because they want to be aligned with that. They want to be aligned with that audience. And, um, you know, it's just, it's a lot of fun to see more girls coming out. And I think I mentioned this before we started recording, like I went to the driving range the other day and I was so pissed because there was no spots open, but I was just in awe because half the people there were girls. And it was like, yeah. I'd never seen that before. Um, and I was impressed. I was happy and sad at the same time. And <laughs> I felt like, okay, I'm doing my job a little bit, you know, like it's, it's happening right? You go to tournaments now, you're seeing a lot more girls hanging around. Mm -hmm. You're seeing a lot more daughters with their dads that are wanting mm -hmm. to go and they're, they're all swagged out in their gear, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's LPGA or PGA tour events. Um, there's more footprint at LPGA events um, in the last couple of years, which is really incredible to see a lot of men, which is nice to see that balance. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, we notice it every time we do something and, and we really take, take that in of like, okay, we've got to keep going. There's more to do, you know? Very cool. Yeah. Kyle, did you have anything else? I don't think so. I don't